make sure we share that on our social media pages and uh, on our website. I know some of it was cut off uh, on the side there, but we'll make sure we get that posted today. Uh, but man, that doesn't get you excited. I don't know what will. God is good, church. And uh, I just pray that we never forget how good he is, and I pray that we never uh, take it for granted. But before we get started, I want to personally thank this church for everything that you guys have done for uh, me and my family this year. Uh, your, your faithful giving over the last couple of years has given me the opportunity to be a full-time pastor, uh, and that is something that I am uh, very thankful for. Uh, if there's no money, there's, there's no staff, and, and as we continue to grow, we'll have to continue to look at that support system. And I'm hoping as uh, after we get Andrew or Dane later next year, we'll uh, start growing him and his new role in the church. But uh, I also want to thank this church because every, every time you post something, every time you share uh, one of our videos on social media, every, every friend that you invite, every conversation that you have uh, with about what's happening at Trinity is, is what makes this church get to where we're at. You know, and, and, and God's been able to use a lot of you guys as a walking invitation to Trinity. And uh, that is saying a lot, and there are, there are so many things that are happening behind the scenes that, uh, that we don't talk about, that people don't get the credit for, and, and I would go down the list and try to thank people, but I'm afraid I'd leave somebody out if I tried to do that, but I just want people to know that it does not go unnoticed, and, and I want to point this out too, that part of be, being a, a pastor of a church and becoming a pastor of a church is looking at how that church is going to treat a pastor's family, and uh, you guys treat us very well as a, as, a, as a pastor and his family. Most of you know, some of you probably don't have any idea, but me and Becky uh, suffered a miscarriage earlier this month, and just the prayers, the cards that have been sent to us has been something that's uh, been overwhelming and amazing, and, and Monday we were talking about how wonderful sun last Sunday was with the play and all that stuff that was going on, and, and Becky says, man, I just love our church, and I said, I second it. I mean, it's just so true, it's just, uh, you guys are an amazing church family, and, and uh, seeing what God has done at this church has been so amazing, and and uh, it's just been an encouragement. And, and, I, and I'll say this too. Uh, even though y'all give me a lot of gifts of encouragement and thanks, uh, one thing that means more than anything to me is that y'all do it to my kids. Uh, I, I, uh, I've been a preacher's kid my entire life almost. My dad is a preacher. And I've sat through churches my entire life. And I can tell you right now, being a preacher's kid is just as much, they're just as involved in ministry as the pastor. And uh, they're here every time the doors are open, and they have to be okay with me being on the phone when I'm home and working on sermons when I'm home and leaving at weird hours to do funerals and, and going out of towns for, for weddings and, and visiting with people, and I can go on and on, but uh, I know I don't say it enough, but I just want to make it as clear as I can. Uh, thank you guys for making Trinity what it is, uh, because this is a church made for people. Without people, it would just be an empty building. And uh, if there's one lesson I want, to, I want you guys to understand as we look at the new year, it's at this, man. <laughs> things aren't falling apart in this world, but things are falling into place. Right? They're not falling apart, but they're falling into place. When I study the Bible and, and I fast and I pray, I know for a fact that God is not sitting in heaven worried or stressed or anxious about what's happening down here on this earth. You understand that? And so we shouldn't be either. We shouldn't be either. Uh, so now that I've, I've, I've thanked you guys and hopefully made you feel good, it's time to speak some hard truths to you. Uh, when I was a manager at Walmart, one of the head guys at Walmart comes to, to, the, to, the, to the store, and uh, me being a sucker, I go, oh, you have any advice for a young manager? He said, absolutely. Before you critique somebody, give them three compliments, and then you tell them how terrible they are at their job. And so uh, there's your compliments. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, but let's get to God's word today. If you have your Bible this morning, we're going to be looking at Mark chapter 10, 17 through 31. Mark chapter 10, 17 through 31. I hope everybody had a wonderful Christmas yesterday. Uh, I know that uh, our Christmas was a lot of fun. It was busy. Uh, we had our Crozier Christmas on Thursday, uh, which is also a lot of fun. And I, I always tell my brothers, for years I've been telling my brothers that uh, I'm the best at everything. <laughs> everything that, you know what I'm saying? As a kid, they didn't believe me. As an adult, they don't believe me. And uh, this was true on Thursday. Uh, it's interesting because they always try to challenge me at something every year. But I've dominated when it came to basketball. So we don't play basketball anymore at my house, at my mom's house. We used to play a game called the Tonk. Some, some amateurs call it 
bocce ball, but I, we call it the tonk, the professional. Uh, uh, down like that. So they don't play me the tonk anymore. And so they got this brainiac idea that this year, this is how they're going to beat me. They're gonna, we're going to do an eggnog challenge. Everybody bring your favorite eggnog brand. And we will do a blind taste test to see who has the best eggnog. All right. <laughs> now, I'm a competitive person, so I started doing my research. You see, growing up, my, my, my family used to always, we always drank uh, trout eggnog. Anybody remember trout? Trout eggnog. We used to, that was the only eggnog we would ever get, trout. Spelled trout, spelled trout, pronounced trout, trout. Anyway, that was eggnog. And so I said to myself, as I'm doing this research, of what kind of brand eggnog I'm gonna bring. I want it to look just like a trout eggnog, all right? I want it to cart to look kind of the same and feel the same. I wanted the taste to be the same. And I wanted it to be a, a brand that wasn't just a big name brand, but I wanted it to be a family-owned brand. You know what I'm saying? Just like trout. And so I went and I found CF Burger. 150 years of dairy farming. I said, that's it, buddy. And I got that and I took it to the, I took it to the uh, Christmas party on Thursday. We all got our, our eggnogs, and they had their big name eggnogs. I had C.F. Berg. C.F. Berg. And so we get all this stuff in order. And uh, <laughs> I've been tasting different eggnogs for like three weeks trying to get ready for this, okay? Different brands. This is how, this is how serious I am. We get the eggnogs. They bring the first cup out, number one. And I, I could smell it, and I thought immediately I knew it was Ryder's eggnog. And I also knew that's what my mom brought in. So I said, that's Ryder's eggnog. I said, Mom, this is yours. And I said, I said, that's you. I can tell by my nose that this is Ryder's eggnog. So then we tasted it. Sure enough, my mom goes, Aiden, how in the world did you know that? That's my, this, this is my eggnog. I said, exactly. <laughs> the second eggnog comes out, I taste it. It tastes like vanilla. And I knew Aaron brought vanilla eggnog, okay? So what did I do? Because I know everybody loves Aaron. I said, this is my eggnog. <laughs> So I can taste it from my mile away. I know that this is number two, even though I knew it was Aaron. So this one's mine. So we went through all the eggnogs. Everybody had an eggnog. There was only one drink we didn't taste. It was Adam's, because Adam brought a Methodist eggnog that uh, was probably inappropriate to bring at a at a thing. So we left that one for Adam. Uh, we tasted like all of And it came down to two eggnogs. Number two, which was Aaron, but they thought it was mine. And number five. And so I said, guys, number two is it. Everybody vote for number two. This is the best one. And all because I knew how much they hate me, they all voted for number five. <laughs> Chad comes out with number five, C.F. Burger. <laughs> My brothers were being quiet the rest of the night. It was bliss for uh, April Crozier. So anyway, it goes to show you. Uh, that your pastor has many skills, you know what I'm saying? Many skills. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and it brought me great joy, and I hope that you guys uh, were able to find some joy this Christmas as well. But uh, as you can see by the, the looks of the church, once Christmas is over for Avery Crozier, it's over. And uh, I'm ready to move on to the new year and uh, go on, move on and look forward to what God has, has planned for us in the future. And I know that some people get a, a, a lot of stuff for Christmas. Other people don't get what they want for Christmas. Some people don't get anything for Christmas. But regardless of how this weekend went for you, uh, would you be willing to give it all up for Jesus Christ? Let's all stand for reading this holy word. Mark chapter 10, 17 through 31. Mark chapter 10, 17 through 31. As he was setting on, out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him. And he asked him, good teacher, what shall I do so that I may inherit eternal life? But Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth. Looking at him, Jesus showed love to him and said to him, one thing you lack. Go and sell all you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. But he was deeply dismayed by these words and, and he went, saying, uh, went away grieving for he was one who owned much property. And Jesus looking around said to his disciples how hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus responded again and said to them, children, how hard it is. 
to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go to the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were even more astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? Looking at them, Jesus said, with people it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, Behold, we have left everything, and we have followed you. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mothers or fathers or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. May God bless you in his holy word. You may be seated. You may be seated. Here's the, here's the uh, problem that we have in church today. Here's the problem we have in church today. We, we have a, a bunch of, of, of weak-minded, gossip-yielding, live for God on Sunday, forget about Him on Monday kind of people inside of our churches. We have the kind of people who never pick up the Bible. No one knows if you're going to show up to church on a Sunday or not, or, or if you're going to take the day off because uh, you're tired, too tired for God. And you may be sitting there going, well, it doesn't hurt everyone to miss church every once in a while, you know? But what you don't realize is your kids are watching you put church on the bottom of your priority list when you miss church. You know, and let me tell you something, when your kids get older, church won't even be in their vocabulary if you put church on the bottom of your priority list. Won't even be on, in their vocabulary. And then when you call me up and you say, hey, I need to have a meeting because my kids just won't come to church and they're older and they have my grandkids and I want my grandkids in church but I can't get them my son. It's like, well, hello? You're the problem. You made church at the bottom of the priority list. So don't expect your kids to put it at the top of theirs. It doesn't make any sense. And you know, I, I'm telling you, I, I, I knew this was going to happen. I should have put up a sign today that said, enter at your own risk. And some of your toes are going to be upset stepped on and everybody's going to be upset. But I'm telling you this, this, we're going to get to some hard truths today because some of you guys are walking on eggshells waiting for the church to make you mad so you can have a reason to walk away from your faith. How, how sad. The amount of times people say, well, I'm not a Christian because I was hurt by the church blows my mind. You were hurt by a church? Get over it. Amen. Go to another church if you have to. Go to another church. Do not allow a rotten Christian to ruin your faith. Here in this passage, we see many. Uh, we, we see a man say to Jesus, "What must I do to inherit eternal life?" A wonderful question. A wonderful question. A question that we should ask in our own lives. What do you have to do when it comes to your life to be able to inherit eternal life? Or do you even know what it means to have eternal life? Do you even know what it means to have eternal life? You see, the sad part is if this if this happened in our churches today, if somebody said there and came inside of our churches and said the same question, "Hey, what are we supposed to do? How am I supposed to inherit eternal life?" If this happened in today's churches. I can promise you this is going to be our answer. Well, just give the 10%. Do, do, do enough to be an active member inside of our church. You know? Make sure you go to those membership classes. Sign up for the small groups. Maybe join the worship team. Wear those skinny jeans real tight so it rides up your butt and can't walk inside the church. You know what I'm saying? That's the kind of stuff we want to tell everybody. And then make a post every once in a while on Facebook about how, how Christian you are. And then you're going to be good to go. Then you'll be good to go. Don't worry about baptisms. Don't worry about surrendering your life to Christ. Don't worry about repenting of your sin. Don't worry about going to church. Don't worry about picking up the Bible because our doctorate pastor will preach theology and he will make assumptions that are not even in the Bible, but he'll make you leave thinking you're smarter than everybody else. You know? That's what we tell these people. When, 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 I, I always say, when a pastor says a Greek word, I always look around looking for somebody who's Greek. You know what I'm saying? Does anybody know what he's talking about? Greek. What are we talking about? You know what I'm saying? I, it blows my mind. And here's the thing. How do you even know what he said was Greek? Or Hebrew. You know, I don't know. If somebody says a Hebrew word, I'd be like, oh, okay, cool. I'll, I'll take your word for it. I don't know Hebrew. You know? So why are you talking about it in church? It blows my mind. But that's not what Jesus did. Je Listen, Jesus was the greatest preacher. He was the greatest teacher, minister of the Bible. And we don't study him. We like to study everybody else but Jesus when it comes to teaching. And it's funny because some of my peers uh, would, would just hate Jesus as a preacher today. You know what I'm saying? Jesus uh, preached relevant sermons. And, and he used illustrations. You know? And uh, he called out the elite and the religious leaders. Boy, they'd have a field day with him if he was here right now. You know what I'm saying? Preaching. But when Jesus answers this man, he gives him a list of the law. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Do not defraud. Honor your father and, and mother. But he said, one thing is lacking. One thing is lacking. 
Let me ask you this, church. What is lacking in your life? What is lacking? When, when it comes to your faith, what is stopping you from fully surrendering your life to Christ? This young ruler wasn't a bad guy. In fact, you know, when Jesus goes through the commandments, the, the ruler says, I've kept all these things. I've kept them all. Now, I don't know about you, but those are hard to keep. Those are hard to keep. Especially that last one, honor your mother and father. You know what I'm saying? It's hard to keep, man. It's hard to keep. You think that? I'm online, so I gotta be careful. <laughs> it's hard to, to keep that sometimes, you know what I'm saying? Because they're getting a little bit older. And I won't even go there. <laughs> but it's hard to keep those commandments. And, and even when like when Jesus explains it in, in, in Matthew, when he starts in, in the Sermon on the Mount, he starts explaining uh, these commandments. And he says, Look, if, if you even look at a woman, it, you're committing adultery. Right? The, the hatred in your heart for somebody is just as bad as, as murdering someone. But, but this guy says, look, I've kept the commandments. And so we know this guy was a good guy. He was a good man. We, we also know because he was wealthy that it sounded like he was a smart man. You know? I never understood when people go, well, you were just born into money. Listen to me. If Abraham Kirsch was born into money, I would still be as broke as I am today. You know what I'm saying? I don't, if, if, I, if I want to build a billion dollars, I'm going to tell you, I'll tell you what I'll do with it. If I ever want a billion dollars, I would buy an Amazon warehouse. <laughs> Just one, whatever's in it, is mine. <laughs> and Monday through Saturday, 9 to 5, I would just play in the Amazon warehouse. You know what I'm saying? Have fun. You can have, I mean, good grades. They got so much stuff in there. 9 to 5, and I'd come home for dinner. I'd, I'd, I'd be a family man. I'd come home for dinner. Sundays, we'd go to church. But then Mondays, I'd go right back to the Amazon warehouse. That'd be so fun. That's how, I'm telling you. I would waste a billion dollars real quick if he gave me a billion dollars, all right? So this guy, obviously, even though he was probably born into it, we don't know, but, but obviously he was a good man, he was a smart man, and even in this passage, we know that he's coming to Jesus with a serious question because he wants uh, to know how he can gain eternal life. And so he realized that Jesus was important. He realized that he was important, that he needed to go to him to get the answer. He was doing the right thing. Some of you guys are, are, are doing the right thing. Some of you guys are good people. Some of you are doing the right thing. You're coming to church. You're recognizing you need to be here. You know, you're a good person by the world's standards. But I'm going to tell you what Jesus tells this rich guy. Those things will not get you in heaven. You have to recognize that there is a cost for living for Christ. There's a cost. I was speaking to a, a, a pastor. He preaches to a church. There's about 3,000 people every Sunday to this church that he preaches at. He runs a large church. And, and, and I always tell people, give me 10 minutes. With a guy like that, and I could probably change the world. You know what I'm saying? But we were talking about the, the work that goes into growing a church. And he said, Abram, the amount of people who walk inside of my church and want what I have is incredible. Young pastors, old pastors, right? They go, man, I'd love to preach to, to 3,000 people on any given Sunday. But he said the difference is they don't want to pay the cost to sit there and, and get to that point of preaching to 3,000 people. And I said, well, what's the cost? I'll pay it. You know he goes, listen, they, they, don't, they don't want to go through the heartache of, of firing staff members that you love, but they're not doing their job, right? He said, he said, they don't want to go through the pain that your family has to go through to make the sacrifices to grow a church that size. They don't want to have to answer the 3,000 phone calls that come with 3,000 people. And he said, they also don't want to spend the hours that I have to spend in prayer praying for those 3,000 people. He said, there's a cost. And it's not just in growing a church, but, but there's, a, there's a cost in anything that you want to do in your life, right? One of the saddest things about social media in this day and age and all these young kids, they all think that, that they can become successful in a moment. They can become successful in an instance. They can become successful in, 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 no, in no time at all. They can become successful, right? They don't have to do anything except be uh, on social media and everything will be great. It blows my mind. It blows my mind. It blows my mind. Everything is going to be great. I'm going to tell you this, man. You get on social media nowadays, some, it takes one or two kids to sit there and put spiky dreadlocks on, sing Island Boy song, whatever the case is. You know? I'm an Island Boy. And then they got nothing. They get like 50 million followers. It blows my mind. How is that possible? How is that even possible? It blows my mind. And so I'm like, listen, there's, there's a cost to this thing, okay? You kids, if any of these kids in this church 
start spiking up their dreadlocks or getting dreadlocks and spiking their spiking their up. I'm telling you, we're gonna have a little talk. Me and you, we're gonna have a little talk. I promise. You, you know? There's a there's a better way to, to find success. I always think it's funny when people try to be musicians in Northern Kentucky. Like they're like, I'm gonna be famous. I'm in Northern Kentucky. It's like, ah. are you really? They play a couple shows here and they're like, I'm gonna be famous, man. It's like, you think somebody's going to come to Northern Kentucky and, and discover you? You know? There ain't nothing to do around here. There ain't nobody's coming. Like, LA, they're not coming to Northern Kentucky. There's a cost. If you want to become a rock star, you got to move to Nashville. You know, you got you to go to LA. You got to go where the music scene is. There's no music scene in Northern Kentucky. I hate to break it to people. You know what I'm saying? Okay? The bar down the street is not a music scene. Okay? And uh, none of those people in that bar are going to make you successful. Hey, ah! Jesus is saying this. Let me tell you. Jesus is saying this, this young man. You do you really want eternal life? Do, do, do you really want to know that when you die, you're going to sit there and end up in heaven? Do you really want to know that? Right? I've done so many funerals where, where the person had, had nothing to do with God. They had, they had nothing to do with God. Maybe they went to church when they were 10 with their, with their grandma, but, but here they are. The thing they're doing at 30 put them in the grave room. And yet everybody assumes they're in heaven. Why? Why? Did they, did they ever surrender their life to Christ? Did they have a relationship with Christ? So what you're telling me is that they did whatever they want, spoke however they want, did whoever they want, and because they passed away, they automatically get to go, go to heaven. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. There's a cost to following Christ. There's a cost. And that cost is giving up the very thing that's stopping you from having a relationship with him. For some of you guys, you're going to have to go and, and give up smoking. Right? Because it's stopping you from fully surrendering your life to him. Because instead of you going to God when you're stressed, you start smoking on that cigarette. You know what I'm saying? Or something else. You know what I'm saying? It's not maybe, it's maybe you're smoking something else. But if it's stopping you from your relationship with God, listen, you got to cut it off. You know? For some of you, you need to give up on the politics. <laughs> For some of you, all you want to give up on the politics. Why? Because it's causing you to be hateful. It's causing you to lose your Christianity. You're being a terrible witness. All right? Now listen, if you want to get into politics and you can still be a Christian, I don't know how you can do that, but uh, try. Okay? But if, but if it's causing you to, to, to literally lose your faith, and it's causing you to say words that you should not be saying as a Christian, you got to cut it off. You understand this? Cut it off. It blows my mind. It, 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 it's, it's both sides, man. I remember like a couple, I, I was watching the NBA yesterday, Christmas. It was my first Christmas, but I was able to just sit down and watch some basketball, man. I was having a good old time yesterday. And I thought, man, I remember a couple years ago, maybe even last year, I don't even remember now. These guys were all kneeling. They were saying Black Lives Matter. They were sitting there, you know, protesting. And they, some of them walked out of their games to say, I'm taking I'm take a stand to make some changes. And I'm sitting there going on Christmas Day. I'm thinking, what change did that actually do? They're wrong. Same boat. Our society hasn't changed one bit. And these guys are still making millions of dollars. <laughs> Politics. Some of you guys need to give up complaining, too. <laughs> And this isn't just for Abram's sake, even though I would appreciate it. <laughs> amen, amen. But, but some of y'all need to give up complaining. Because it's literally causing you to miss the blessings and joy of following God because you're so caught up in finding the negative and everything that everybody's doing. Can you believe what they wore to church? Can you believe that they said over there? Can you believe his wife didn't show up today with him? Can you believe the, the, the cameras are up on the front pew and nobody can sit up there? Y'all right. Y'all are bad. Nobody sits up here anyway. You know what I'm <laughs> it blows my mind. All right. What's the cost? Only you know what's lacking. Only you can repent of it. So what is lacking in your life? Secondly, listen to this. Who can be saved? Anyone who's ready to deny himself, take up that cross and follow Jesus can be saved. It's not just for the elite. It's not just for, for the educated. It's not just for the Jews. It's anyone who is willing to deny themselves. The question is, are we truly ready to do that? Because we live in a society where we say, I am who I am. 
I was born this way. I identify myself by, by who I sleep with. But here's the problem with that mindset. Are you willing to give up a certain lifestyle for Christ? Are you willing to surrender your life for Christ? Are you able to give up your sin for Christ? Are you, are you willing to turn away from everything our society says we should embrace to follow Christ? Most times we want, we want the blessing, but we want, we want the blessing while we live our own life and seek our own happiness and do things our way. We aren't, we aren't willing to live for Christ to obtain the blessing. When you look at the disciples, they gave up everything. They gave up their businesses, they gave up their careers, they gave up their families, they gave up their relationships, right? And when you study how their lives ended on earth, they were beaten, killed, abused, all for the sake of the gospel. That's what they gave it up for. They gave up, they gave up all those worldly things, and they still suffered and died. Okay? And you say, why would somebody do that? Why would somebody follow Jesus, give up everything, and suffer their lives for it? And the apostles told us why. They told us why. John says in 1 John, he says, we proclaim to you what we have seen and what we have heard. What we, when Peter and John were arrested in Acts chapter 4 for preaching the gospel, they were eventually released and, and they, were, they were told never speak about Jesus ever again. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it's right in the sight of God and listen to you rather than God and make your own judgment, for we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. This message comes from the ones who literally experienced Christ firsthand. They were there. This is an eyewitness testimony in the world. I was at a Christmas party a couple days ago, and, and, and there, was a, there was a guy there that was just, uh, he was the most annoying person I've ever met in my entire life. I'll be honest with you, all right? He was annoying. And it was at, about halfway through our Christmas party, the, the guy says, I know I'm annoying, but, and he kept being annoying. And I thought, that's so weird. You know you're annoying, and you're still being annoying. Like, I get it if you don't know, because there's some people, God love them, they're oblivious to how annoying they are, you know what I'm saying? They walk around, and they're just annoying, you know what I'm saying? Like, you, some of them just don't know how annoying they are, you know what I'm saying? I would probably put myself in that category. <laughs> Somebody tells me I'm annoying, it really breaks my heart. I'm like, for, I was probably three months into preaching here at Trinity, 2019, and, and that was one of the critiques I got. Somebody said, hey, I'm like, I heard it from a third, I don't know if it was true, I heard it from a third person, but they go, the guy said, you were annoying to listen to. Oh, okay. <laughs> Recognize that you're annoying. Let me tell you, if you recognize you're annoying, fix it. Change it. Don't say the but after you, you know, I know I'm annoying, but no, no, just say I'm annoying and we'll shut up. You know, that's all I'm thinking. And, and it's like that for everything. You know, if, if you recognize that you have a problem, fix it. The first step in, 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 in solving a problem is recognizing that you have a problem, you know? It, so, so you have to sit there. Uh, the things that you're struggling with, because I get phone calls all the time. Abram, I, I struggle with this. Abram, I, str I struggle with that, you know? You, you, you're, you're sitting there and you're living in, in sin, but you're not doing anything about it. God wants you to surrender everything to him. Everything. Is God more important than your family? Is God more important than your sin? Is God more important than your job? Is God more important than the buzz you get from drinking and smoking or, or eating brownies? You know, is, is God more important than, than, than your, your children? Is God more important than all these things in your life? God doesn't just want part of your life. He doesn't want just part of your heart, but God wants all of it. And I'm going to tell you this, there's nothing more freeing than giving everything you have to God. Because every material thing will fade away. Of all the toys my kids got yesterday, 60% of them are already broken. <laughs> okay. Most of them their own fault, but there was a couple last night that stepped on, but, but you know, so you can't leave those things out. But I thought to myself, man, all these presents, and they are, th today, the day after Christmas, they're only going to be able to play with 40%. How? How's that possible? Because everything they get, everything we have, it's all going to fade away. And I'm going to tell you something about these dumb toys. Every toy needs a battery. <laughs> and none of the toys need the same battery. You know, it's not just all double A's. I could do double A's. No, there are double A's and triple A's, and, 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 and there's like C things, and, and there's, you know, the hearing aid batteries. I'm like, this isn't a hearing aid. It's a, it's a, it's a car. Why do I need hearing aid batteries? Uh, so anyway, mm, this little, I'll tell you this too. Might as well, since I'm on my soapbox. 
every screw is a different size, and you gotta get 20 different screwdrivers. I told Becky, I said, I asked for the wrong things this Christmas. I should have asked for batteries and different screwdriver sizes. Alright, I'm off. I'll go ahead and tell you more. My wife, back in November, my wife said, uh, she said, oh, Emma, I really love this sweat. It had somebody's birthday, like the year of their birth on the sweater, like it said, like 1974. I said, how cool would that be? I would love the sweater. And so me, I go, oh, you know, it's her birthday coming up, it's Christmas. And so I went ahead and got this sweater in, 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 in November. I'm, supposed to, I'm gonna tell your age, it's supposed to say 1988, okay? And so I got it, I ordered it in November, wrapped it, I was so happy, done. I got more stuff than that, okay, but. But that was, uh, I was excited about it. And got it back in November. She finally opens it yesterday. Wrong date. 1991. <laughs> <laughs> so if she wears a 1991 shirt, y'all better believe it. That is not how old she is. It's a lot. <laughs> These things, man. Material things will fade away. <sighs> it's crazy, though. We kill ourselves all year to gain these things, you know, uh, that last just for a moment. But, but God is eternal. So what are we giving up for him? Ladies, I need a couple messages to talk to, your, to the men in the room, all right? Look, like, if you don't mind, we, got, we have some men that have some problems in this place. We, we have a, a bunch of men in this place who act like boys. This is the truth. We have this tough interior where we're trying to be all bad and, and tough, but deep down they know their marriage is struggling. Right? Deep down there's, there's some men in here that know their faith is struggling. There's a reverend, his name was Reverend Sylvester Graham, and he wanted to stop the men in his congregation from, from sinning with sexual urges, and so he created this stale cracker. And he told the women of the church, if you just give this to your husband and, and your sons, it will stop them from having these sinful desires and sinful urges. And so he created this cracker, gave it to him, and uh, doctors got his doctor, found this, this, this cracker, and he was like, this is kind of a weird thing. And, and his brother accidentally dropped some sugar on it, cooked it up, and he tasted it. He said, this is the greatest thing in the world. His brother ended up starting a, 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 like a manufacturing company, a, a brand. It was called Kellogg's. <laughs> and that cracker ended up being called the Graham Cracker, named after Reverend Sylvester Graham. Look it up. You're welcome. <laughs> Here's the thing, I'm not offering a cracker, but I'm here to offer you the bread of life. You have to stop hiding behind this tough exterior. You know? You, you may have your, your wife and kids fooled, you may have your, your, your boss fooled, you may have the church fooled, but you aren't fooling God. Your marriage cannot work without God. Your children will not get to heaven without God. Your career that for some of you is your everything and for others it's the uh, bane of your existence will not last forever. So you better put your worth in something else other than that career because it's, gonna, it's not going to last very long. What's it going to take you to inherit the kingdom of God? What is it in your life that you need to give up in order for you to fully surrender your life to God? Matthew 16, 24 says this. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself take up his cross and follow me. And follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what good will it do a person if he gains the whole world but forfeits his soul? Or what will a person give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father and with his angels and will then repay every person according to his deeds. There is a cost. John, John chapter 2, Jesus is meeting with Nicodemus and he tells him, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. One of the blessings that we have at Trinity is people who, who have come forward and have received Christ as their Lord and Savior and, and we've watched them go through baptism as a public profession of their faith as a symbol of their old life being, being dead and, and coming up new. And at Trinity we see all young people uh, come forward. We see old people come forward and make their decision. And here's the craziest thing about it. And I see this all the time. Nobody ever questions when an old person comes forward. You know? We go, oh yeah, his life must have been terrible. That's why he came up, you know? That makes sense. That makes perfect sense. When a young person comes up, it happens every time. Everybody goes, oh, I don't know about that. Is he ready to come forward? He might be a little too young. Whoa, I don't, I don't, ooh, I don't know if he is. That, ooh, how old is he? Is he allowed to be able to come forward? It blows my mind. Jesus said, let the little children come to me. He didn't say be little. You know? Because when a, an adult gets in a little kid's face and says, okay, now tell me what you believe. Tell me that you believe it. Tell me what you believe. Tell me the theology of Jesus. Tell me the gospel. It's a kind of intimidating, don't you think? And this is what we do to children. We, 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 as soon as they come forward, we go, all right, 
You know what I'm saying? Doesn't make any sense to me. Jesus said, let the little children come to me. Jesus said in Matthew 18, 3, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of God. We need to be more like these kids. We need to be, we need to be more like these kids. We need to have the faith of these kids. You know? What we don't need is to yell at them for responding when God touches their heart. Because if we do that, when they get older and they, and they feel that Holy Spirit tugging on their heart again, and they're going to sit there and go, well, I can't come forward because the last time I came forward, I got yelled at. I promise you that's how it will happen. I was baptized at a fairly young age. Only been baptized once. And guess what? I became a preacher. Ain't that something? Ain't that something? Imagine if my mom said, uh-uh, you ain't ready, Abraham. Imagine. But instead, guess what? Me coming forward and receiving Christ at a young age, I didn't understand everything. All right? But, but it, it, it literally, my family held me accountable because I, I was baptized. You know that? My, my church family held me accountable because I was baptized. You know? The community held me accountable. When I was bad in school, I'd ask somebody go, hey, you're a Christian. You shouldn't be out like that. You know? You know how scary that is to be able to say, yeah, everywhere you go, people know that you're a Christian. Like, that stuff holds you accountable. You know? So who can be saved? Anyone. Anyone that says, I'm ready to give up my life and surrender it to Christ. When Jesus died on the cross, he bore our iniquities, and during God's wrath, he cried out, it is finished. By this, he meant that the full atonement for all of the, of the sins, past, present, and future, has been made. His work of redemption now completed, and our entire sin debt is paid in full. And let me tell you something. You can walk in that promise. All you have to do is put your trust in Jesus Christ. There's nothing, nothing that, uh, that, that can stop you from doing that. And as long as you are willing to repent. Because here's the thing. There's something like it in every one of us today. The great part about it is you can repent of it. Don't be like that rich ruler who turned his back on God because he cared more about his finances than he did his own soul. You need to repent of the way you're living. Repent of the way that you're, of your thinking. Be willing for a change to take place in your life. And after you repent, then you need to believe. Believe. Believe in, believe in Jesus Christ. He's the only way to heaven, but you have to receive him. And, and once you receive him, then you need to surrender your life to him. And I promise you, your life won't get any better. Right? As far as worldly standards. Right? You're still going to go home and you're, you're still going to have that marriage issue. Because guess what? Just because you receive Christ doesn't mean that your marriage is just all of a sudden going to be perfect. When you go to work on Monday, guess what? The, ball, the same boss is still going to be there. Sometimes we... People get bad, people get received Christ and they go, Well, I thought my boss would be gone and I thought God would be you know. <laughs> Doves would fly out of the car every time I got out, you know. <laughs> no, nah, man. But you'll possess a joy and a peace that you've never had before. And it can be yours this morning. So as we come to this time of invitation, if you're if you're willing to say, Lord, I do repent, I do receive, and I open up my heart to you, then I'm going to ask you to make a public profession of, of your faith. And you say, why do I have to do it publicly? And why do I have to go in front of everybody and, and make this decision? Because every time God calls somebody in the Bible, he, he did it publicly. He said it publicly. Will you follow me? And that's what he's asking us to do. We're not called to be ashamed. We're called to boldly stand up and say, I'm ready to receive Christ as my Lord and Savior. And if you're here today, you're ready to make that decision, I'm going to ask, ask you after this prayer to get up out of your seat. And make your way to the front. Don't walk out of here without getting your life right with God. Let us pray. Dear Father God, we want to thank you for this glorious day that you have given us, God. And we know that the devil has been working really hard, God, to distract us today. God, I pray that uh, you, uh, you put a hedge of protection around this place, God, and keep all the evil spirits away from us, God, as we sit here and come to this time of invitation. Because I know that your Holy Spirit, in the midst of the chaos and distraction, God, I know your Holy Spirit is working here today, God. And I know that... Uh, there is someone here today that walked in here for another reason than, than, uh, than this one, God. But, but I know that you're working on their heart, God, and you're ready for them to, to get up and to come forward and say, I'm ready to receive Christ as my Lord and Savior, God. And I just pray that you give them the strength to do that, the courage to do that, God, and let us be able to celebrate that at the church. Continue to watch over us, God. In Jesus' precious name, I pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Let's all stand. Good.